everything hath a time, as the Tudors like to say. Good Bible-reading Christians as they were. There is a time to be born and a time to die. A time to win and a time to lose. To everything his due time. This is the extraordinary tale of a peasant's daughter who rose to wealth and status, but lost it all. She survived the plague and lived through four changes of the state religion. She buried three of her children, but she gave birth to the world's most famous poet. This is a story of family and love in a time of revolution. The Tudor age was a, a time of radical transformation in English history and society. It was a time of violence and war, of class conflict and social unrest. The Protestant Reformation turned upside down a thousand years of English Christianity in a mere 20 years. We see that tale more than anything else through the lives of the great rulers, Henry VIII, Mary Tudor, Elizabeth I. But what was it like to live through those times at the grassroots for ordinary people and especially for a woman? <laughs> Arden was one of eight daughters born to an old farming family here in the heart of Warwickshire. But Mary would leave life on the land for the new world of the Tudor middle class. Her children would become haberdashers and glovers. Two of them made it in the entertainment industry in London. So her family story is a mirror of the Tudors changing times. <laughs> Tudor England was a small country, only two and a half million people. An agricultural society where 90% of the population worked on the land. Life expectancy then was 38. A third of all children died before they were 10. Mary's father farmed in Wilmcott in the parish of Aston Cantlow just outside Stratford-upon-Avon. You can see Stratford down there in the Avon Valley, the spire of Holy Trinity peeping above the trees. And the Avon divides the West Midlands landscape here. To the south was the land of open field farming and sheep grazing, what they called the Felden. And to the north, stretching towards Birmingham, a more wild, uncultivated, wooded landscape, the Arden. And that's where Mary's story begins. The Forest of Arden is still a name on the map today, and it gave Mary her name. She had well-to-do Arden relatives who could trace their family tree back before the Norman conquest to local heroes like the legendary Sir Guy of Warwick. But Mary's father, Robert Arden, was just a husbandman, a well-to-do peasant. Born around 1480 at the end of the Wars of the Roses, among his first childhood memories would have been news of the death of Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth. So Mary's father, Robert, was a man from the old world whose daughters would move into the new. Robert built his house here in Wilmcott in 1515. It was identified recently, astonishingly intact behind its skin of Victorian brick. A 
feel like a Tudor estate agent here. Um, this, is the bar this is the barn area and the yard. Just the same dimensions that it would have been in the 16th century. The barns, the brewery, uh, the dairy for making cheese and all that around here. Much larger space than would actually be the living space of the house. Now, come in here. Um, here's a later extension to the kitchen, uh, but the really interesting space is upstairs. It was a traditional peasant house, open to the ceiling. The bedroom floor was put in later. Just come out of the Robert and his wife raised eight daughters here. Mary was the youngest. Forget the floor, as I said before, there's nothing there. This is open to the roof, a fire on the ground floor level, uh, going out through a vent in the roof and nicely seasoning the bacon, which is about there. It's a typical open communal medieval house. A single open hall with the kitchen at one end and the chamber at another. And the chamber end, the mum and dad would have slept downstairs and all the sisters, and all the servants, the maid servants, would have slept on a platform above mum and dad's chamber that you got to by a ladder. Pretty, uh, pretty close and intimate. Not much privacy, but this is the world in which Mary grew up. She was born in around 1535, we can't be sure exactly when, as parish registers don't start this early, but she was baptised here, in the church of Aston Cantlow. This would have been her parish church. Wilmcote, where she was born, didn't have a church, didn't have it until 19th century. It was only a little hamlet. So she would have been born as she was born and then baptised probably about three, three, four days later in this church, in the font which is still there. England was still a Catholic country then, and Mary was named after the Virgin Mary, the patron saint of the village guild, whose chapel was in the side aisle of the church. So this is where Mary was baptised, the medieval font here in Aston Cantlow. And she's born into the world of old-fashioned English country Catholicism, the world of the saints and the old stories. A distant kinsman of hers, John Arden, in his will in 1526, leaves my best damask gown to be made into a coat for the priest, my suit of armour to dress an image of St. George, to be hung above the pew where I was accustomed to sit, and two heifers for the maintenance of the church bells. That's young Mary's world, an intensely local community with that sense of the dear familiar place, as they put it, on the very eve of King Henry VIII's Great Reformation. Mary was born at a crucial time in our history. In 1531, King Henry VIII had split with the Pope and declared himself head of the Church of England. It was the beginning of a vast change, the Protestant Reformation, but they don't know that yet. It's a world in flux, religiously speaking. Henry discouraged some aspects of Catholic cult. He got twitchy in the late 1530s about people lighting candles in front of saints' images. But not a lot else changed. The mass went on exactly as before. In the West Midlands, it's a deeply conservative area. So what youth culture there was would have been Catholic. It would have been focused around the ritual calendar, which was broadly religious, but also festive. So at first, at the grassroots, not much changed. But in Mary's early childhood, events began to gather speed. Between 1536 and 1540, King Henry ordered the dissolution of the monasteries. Centres of enormous wealth and privilege, they held a third of all the land in England. In Mary's village, Aston Cantlow, the local guild was stripped of its land and silver plate. 
when the monasteries were dissolved, those religious institutions disappeared as well. Property sold off. Their property the, was sold, yeah. their land was sold, mm -hmm. uh, some of their artefacts, obviously, everything was sold to raise money for the crown. A Victorian teacher here in the village recorded details of the plunder. Two towels, altar cloths, a pyx, a cope, a worsted cope, and vestments, one of them in silk. These would have been the things the priest wore in... For, for, for the mass. And here, one chalice. But your chalice was saved. It may be that uh, Henry VIII's commissioners sold it back to the parish. Just a little bit of gain. A piece of extortion. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. That precious chalice was saved by the villagers. Oh, my goodness, that is absolutely beautiful, isn't it? And incredibly, they've still got it. It will be used in a nuptial mass for her wedding. She would have held it? Yes. It's absolutely wonderful, isn't it? So when Mary was a girl, England was still a Catholic country, but her world was poised between old and new. In society too, change was in the air. The dissolution of the monasteries flooded the market with land and money, which would give rise to a new middle class. But the Ardens and their neighbours were working people, and they got on with life. By a huge stroke of luck, a list of contents has survived for Mary's house in Wilmcott, which gives us a picture of her life at home. What comes across is that this is a mixed farm. They are keeping animals, they are growing crops, and, and the two are fairly balanced. <laughs> He's got eight oxen. That's not an accident. You need eight oxen to pull a plow. He's not going in for beef very much. He's only got two bullocks, but he is dairying. I mean, seven cows is above average. At the end of the inventory, we have a total uh, valuation of, of uh, 77 pounds, pounds, 11 shillings yeah. and 10 pence. Yeah, That's right. Isn't that a lot of money then? Or? Well, it's, uh, <laughs> it's quite a lot for a husbandman. Most women then were a working class, in the fields, in the house and in the kitchen. So Mary grew up multi-skilling. <laughs> Mary would have been taught from a very early age how to do all the things that were essential. It wasn't just the household and um, the children. It was the swine, the dairy cattle, the fowl, brewing, baking, making cheese. And she had to be a wonderful planner as well. She wasn't just planning next week's meals. She was planning a year in advance. If she hadn't got her rennet made, she wouldn't be making cheese next year. From Mary's time, self-help manuals gave women tips on how to be a good housewife. The knowledge of dairies, malting, oats, and their excellent uses in the families. What about hard agricultural labour? I mean, Robert doesn't have any sons. What does he do when it comes to ploughing time and harrowing and all those sort of heavier jobs? The women it would be expected to muck in. So if the sheep were being sheared, uh, they might be uh, rolling the fleeces and taking them off to be prepared. The men would cut the corn and it would be the women gathering them up and making them into stooks and picking up any bits that had been left. So they were expected not only to run the household and look after the children and everything directly around the farm uh, house, but they also were there at the busy times as well, helping mm. out. Yes. Women were very strong. Um, you wouldn't survive very long if you were, uh, you know, a bit uh, <laughs> weak, shall we yeah. say. But even in Mary's house in Wilmcott, there are hints of the new middle-class taste creeping into the countryside. 
the world to which, as a grown-up, Mary would aspire. At meals, Mary and her sisters would sit on benches, on forms. A chair was a mark of status. Many households only had one chair. Uh, Robert Arden actually has three. So one for him, one for uh, the, the, his wife, mm. another for a guest. Yeah, you know, a guest the, chair. That's right. Feather beds and mattresses yes, and bolsters and yes, things. Yes, you, mm. you don't quite imagine that. Is this new taste coming in, Chris? <laughs> the glass taste? Or well, the feather beds aren't that new, but it's certainly <clears throat> there's a certain emphasis on on, on uh, comfort. You know, there, there are feather beds. There's references to cushions, and uh, you know, it's it's not a bare austere house. To have eleven painted cloths is quite unusual. Most of the walls internally have a painted cloth on them. You could think of it as being like a, a sort of wallpaper, really, you know, it, it, it's, it's decorative. And what we would love to know is what's painted on these, these cloths. I mean, it could be scenes from the Bible, it could be scenes from literature and, and mythology, bright colours and, and, and you know, in, interesting scenes. Yeah. That, so yeah. she grew up with stories, exactly. in one form or other. Exactly, yeah. 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 And for Mary, as a devout Catholic, the most important stories were religious. You can still get a sense of her world here in Stratford's Guild Chapel. It's very hard to imagine it now because it's a pale shadow of what it would have been. But every surface covered in images and stories and warnings. With the Christian souls being reborn and the dead, the, the, going the down wicked into going the down mouth into of hell. hell. It, yeah, it's yeah. a bit like a, a graphic strip cartoon of how to behave in life or else. These were painted in her father's lifetime and whitewashed when Mary was in her 20s. Uncovered in 1804, they were copied while their colours were still bright. The blessings of heaven and the terrors of hell. Such images must have filled her young imagination. Along with the great tales, the murder of St. Thomas Becket, and a favourite story in Stratford. Whoa, look at Lovely that. Dragon. St. George I and the Dragon. I love St. George and the Dragon. Yeah, yeah. But everybody knew that story. Yeah. And the Guild pageant was the pageant of St. George. Yeah. So Robert might have brought his girls over to, to stand it. in the crowd and see the yeah. great dragon with its Coming tail through. like a Chinese New Year well, it, festival. It clearly was like a Chinese dragon because there were payments in the accounts for bearing the dragon. So I imagine lots of little men on sticks underneath this thing yeah. leading it through the street. There were guilds like this in every town, social and religious clubs. The Stratford Guild Book shows that Mary's father joined in 1517. There he is. Right at the top, third entry. Yeah. Robertus Ardren de Wilmacott. And this is going to take us from the chapel, the religious side, out into the social and administrative area, okay. which is through here. So the guilds were centres of social life for men and women before the Reformation. They helped shape the ethos of Mary's childhood world. The Guild Hall. Yeah, great. Ladies and gentlemen, may I ask you to charge your glasses? The main thing that happened here would be the annual feast. The feast was the classic networking opportunity because this is when everybody would be here. You forget about the admin, you forget about the routine. You just enjoy yourselves and relax and chat because you are all officially equal brothers or sisters, there is the opportunity to meet a brother of a different social status. And even a sister. And uh, even a sister and potentially a, a spouse, yeah. yeah. But now, the revolutions of the time begin to turn faster. In January 1547, when Mary was 12, King Henry VIII died. He was succeeded by his nine-year-old son, Edward. Precocious, pious, cold-hearted, Edward was surrounded by Protestant fundamentalists, 
and they began the real religious revolution. Mary's childhood world was about to change forever. So the real religious trauma for Mary Arden would have occurred in her early teens when the mass was abolished, the churches were stripped bare, whitewashed. I suppose people moved from a world in which everything religiously could be taken for granted to a world in which everything religiously was contested. In 1549, the government ordered the Catholic mass to be abolished, and then the old rites for birth and death, the old festivals, even dancing round the maypole was forbidden. Every parish was told to smash its images in wood and stone and stained glass. They were to whitewash the painted walls, the Bible of the poor, and do it properly, the government said, not slobbered over with lime that could be washed off tomorrow, so that no memory remained. It was the beginning of what they called the commotion time. But out in Warwickshire, families like the Ardens remained loyal to the old faith. It would take 40 years for things to change in the countryside. When Mary was about 12, her mother died. Mary's father was now in his late 60s, but a year or two later he remarried Agnes Hill, a younger widow who brought her own four children to live in Wilmcott, along with Mary and her sisters Joyce and Alice. The living space was cramped and relations with their new stepmother would become strained. So Robert drew up leases to protect his own daughters, to make sure that if he died, they would still inherit. Tudor people were hard-headed when it came to property. And for Robert, family came first. Then in 1553, when Mary was 18, King Edward suddenly died and Henry VIII's daughter, Mary Tudor, came to the throne. A convinced Catholic, she set out to turn the clock back. But in winter 1556, Mary's father fell ill. Well, I'm afraid you've got to imagine Robert in bed. He has probably caught a bad attack of the flu because there's a f influenza epidemic uh, going on at this time and it's fatal flu and he knows it's fatal, he knows he's going to die and so he assembles his will. The first thing he thinks out about is the salvation of his soul and so he expresses his religious views by invoking the, uh, the Virgin Mary our Blessed Lady, St. Mary, and the Holy Company of Heaven. These are the phrases which a Catholic layman would use in, those, in, in these circumstances. <laughs> Having looked after his soul, he then disposes of his worldly goods. But singles out his youngest daughter. Yes, that's yeah. the extraordinary thing, that he obviously thinks very well of Mary, I think, you know, because the first thing he thinks of is providing her with uh, uh, land and with money. Uh, and, and it's a very substantial sum of money that he's giving her, six pounds, 13 shillings and fourpence. That's a bit more than a skilled carpenter would earn in a year. So he's leaving her, say, 30,000 pounds. Wow. Which is not bad. Not bad. And uh, uh, r rather surprisingly, as she is the youngest daughter, she is named as one of his executors. Oh. Alice and Mary, my daughters. He obviously um, had, perhaps has some affection for her, or he certainly has some respect for her as well. 
he obviously trusts her. He thinks she's she's a responsible person who will look after his the the, the affairs that are flowing on from his from his will. Does that mean she's got to ride over to Worcester to have, uh, see the will approved? Then I mean, how did it work in those I days? Th Do we know? Yeah, I, th I think she did, and she would also have to uh, negotiate with various other people who received uh, sums of money and so on. Mm -hmm. After all, right at the end, uh, he leaves. Uh, fourpence to everybody in the parish of Aston Cantlow who doesn't have a team. That means someone who doesn't have a team of oxen. Mm. So he's saying the sort of labourers and smallholders of the parish are going to get fourpence each. So presumably Mary has to go around the houses saying, do you have a team? And <laughs> pressing, pressing fourpence into their hands. As her father's legal executor, Mary surely had basic reading skills, like many Tudor women of her class. But could she write? On later legal documents, she makes her mark with her initial. And the wax seal has her personal emblem from her seal ring, a horse. The mark of Mary is a beautifully penned M. That's how you were taught to do your capital letters in what was called secretary hand. And that possibility becomes a likelihood when you look at this document drawn up on the same day in 1579. And there, on the little tag of parchment to the side, messed up because it's over the crinkle of the parchment, and what looks like an abbreviated signature. You put those two together, and uh, it looks very much as if she knew not only how to read, but how to write. She's quite a catch, then. Multi-skilled, literate, maybe. Set up by her dad with money and land. And maybe she had a match already in mind with the son of one of her father's tenants, John Shakespeare. John Shakespeare of Snitterfield had moved to Stratford from the countryside in the early 50s. The son of a husbandman, he'd done a seven-year apprenticeship to the master glover Tom Dixon. So John was a young man with prospects. In October 1556, John buys two freehold properties here in the town, one down the road in Greenhill Street and one here in Henley Street. This is a young man with fantastic drive and determination. And as for the date when he bought this house, it makes you wonder whether, in fact, he already had marriage in mind. Because within weeks of purchasing it, he marries Mary Arden. <laughs> they marry in 1557. He's in his late 20s, she's maybe 22. I pray you, all that are gathered here, in behalf of these souls, John and Mary, to hear and witness that which they intend. First, there'd be a troth plighting in front of family and friends, and later, a church service. And with Mary Tudor on the throne, it's a Catholic wedding with a Latin mass. Then a feast with music, dancing, and lots of drink. No Puritan reserve yet here in Aston Cantlow. And then the newlyweds rode off to begin a new life in Stratford. Stratford then was a small market town with maybe 1,200 people and a growing middle class serviced by tailors, drapers and glovers. It was a place where you could rise in the world. Lovely. The world of Elizabethan interiors. <laughs> I think that, you know, the, the, the time that Mary marries in the 1560s is an interesting time because everything's shifting, everything's changing, you know, the, the, the effects of the religious reformation and then this massive social change as well. 
and there's a shift towards ornamenting interiors, investment in, in the home, um, in the form of wall decoration, in um, material furnishings and, and fabrics and textile items. Let me ask you about this. Yes. I can hand it over to you. So this is sort of late Elizabethan or something like that. Yeah. Mary, Mary might have worn something like this. It's difficult to know. I mean, certainly Mary would have wanted to wear something <laughs> like this because it's got very fine um, decoration. It's, it's called black work. And, and interestingly, even though it's got all of this decoration, it's a garment to be worn informally um, in the house. Mm. And again, I think that really gets to the, the heart of the significance of the household. If you're worried about wearing something as beautiful as this in in your home, then it indicates just how important a space for social display and, um, and, and perhaps some social competition that the household was in this period. Are we allowed to talk about middle-class taste and sort of rising up in the world and, you know, competitiveness with your neighbours? Yeah, or I mean... I think uh... so. I think definitely. I think, you know, you've got a little bit of extra money and you use that money to embellish your immediate environment, your clothing and, of course, your house. So, and, and yeah, in, a, in an urban setting, you are going to be thinking about keeping up with the Joneses. There's going to be that sense of wanting to have a house that fits with your status. Like most young couples, they wanted to start a family. But in Tudor England, having children was fraught with danger. A third of all babies died in the first year. And Mary's first two children both die. Joan in 1558, aged two months. And then Margaret, who died in 1563, aged one. 1563, Margaret, daughter of John Shakespeare. Unfortunately, it wouldn't have been that unusual. There's an expectation now that children will outlive their parents, and that, unfortunately, wasn't the case in the past. The first reliable statistics on the causes of death come from London in the early 1600s. The biggest cause of death is actually this category called chrisoms and infants, yeah. um, which is, you know, it's babies, it's children that are within a couple months of birth and it's almost 2,400 wow. uh, deaths in one year. So a quarter of all the deaths in London are, uh, yeah. are children in their first few months. Mm -hmm. That's Mary's first two kids. People sometimes tell you that, oh, they can't have felt as much as we do yeah. because they had lots of children and then lots of children died. But is that the case? I think that a lot of historians have um, altered their, their thinking on this um, because we have found there are some really striking accounts of people grieving for their children, trying to deal with the pain of that. There are manuals from the period that help you, help you um, work to be the healthiest kind of person you can be, and that includes the emotions. So interestingly, it gives guidelines about how you should try to manage your emotions, and a lot of the manuals say that grief is the emotion that is most devastating, not just to the mind and soul, but to the body. Um, and in fact, if we look in this bill, compared to, you know, ch infant deaths, it's a very small category, but there is a category for grief here. Mm -hmm. 20 people who died of grief in London uh, in mm -hmm. this year. But nevertheless, we've also found documents that suggest that while people were aware of the fact that they were supposed to ideally moderate their emotions, that they also felt very deeply. Um, and there are people who say things like, I, I know that I shouldn't be grieving this extremely. I know that you know, my child was never really mine because my child belongs to God and God has decided to take him or her back. But nevertheless, I can't, I can't stop feeling the way I do. So the first years of marriage were hard for Mary, but at least her husband was doing well. His freehold in Henley Street entitled him to join the town elite. The corporation had replaced the guild, which was shut down under Edward in 1547, and they ran the town. The council books show that John's civic duties range from ale taster to constable and charity doles to the poor. Meeting of the Stratford upon Avon Corporation at the hall held in our garden the 30th day of August, anno 1564. Money paid by us towards the relief of the poor. From the mayor, Mr. Waitley, 
two shillings and four pence. From John Shakespeare, 12 pence. He was a man they could trust, a man of credit. God bless Queen Elizabeth! Wassail! But in winter 1558, Mary Tudor suddenly died, and Henry VIII's daughter Elizabeth came to the throne. In Warwickshire, they greeted her accession with bonfires and doles of cakes and ale to the poor. They sang Latin masses for the new queen, but Elizabeth was a Protestant, and within the year, she reversed Mary's return to Catholicism. We tend to think of the Elizabethan settlement as a period in which the Reformation finds itself, it, it beds down. It didn't look like that to people in the 1560s. Everything was up for grabs. There's a great sense of anxiety on the part of those responsible for enforcing what is quite certainly in 1558 a minority religion. The Queen's Protestantism is a minority religion. It was the fourth change of religion in 20 years. And at this moment, no one knew how long Elizabeth would live or what would happen next. Soon, there were risings against her religious policies. And in response, the government demanded the removal of all outward trappings of the old faith. There's a pogrom to get rid of this stuff because during the rebellion in the north, the altar stones had reappeared, the mass books had come out, the holy water pots had come out, women had started queuing to be churched. So there is a tremendous determination to remove these physical anchors for backward-looking sentiment. In winter 1563, the Stratford Council had to do the government's bidding. Final act in the story is entered into the, the council minutes for the winter of 1563. Among various expenditures is this. Item paid for defacing the images in the chapel, two shillings. That's for the whitewashing of all the paintings in this chapel so that no memory remains, as the government said. And the person who signed off on it is the Chamberlain, Mary's husband, John Shakespeare. What Mary thought, we don't know. But in April 1564, her third child was born, a boy. They called him William. And after losing her first two children, you'd imagine he was the apple of her eye. Mary would have stayed at home for the first month to regain her strength before the traditional purification ceremony at church on the 28th of May. But when Mary's baby was three months old, the plague came to Stratford. 1564, here began the plague. London was already reeling with thousands of deaths when, on the 11th of July, the apprentice Oliver Gunn died of the pestilence. Soon the town was living in fear. At the end of August, the town corporation held their meeting out here in the open air in the garden behind the Guildhall to try to lessen the risk of contagion because they believed that plague was passed by infected heirs. But by then, seven weeks since the first case, the situation for the town was becoming desperate. Over 200 people died in Stratford, a sixth of the town. Richard Simmons, the town clerk, lost two sons and a daughter. The Greens, three doors down from Mary in Henley Street, four children. With a young baby, it was best to get out if you could. And Mary, you'd guess, rode out to her sister in Wilmcott. Only five miles away, 
but here in the country air, there wasn't a single death. So luckily for Mary, and for the rest of us, William survived. And the next few years were good times for Mary and her husband. She had more children, Joan, Anne, Gilbert and Richard. She would have had an important role in their preschool education, teaching them the alphabet and basic reading at home. But of course, like all mothers, she also told stories. Merrier than a nightingale that I shall sing. There's no television, there's no radio, um, there are no DVDs. What you do, and especially in the long winter evenings, is tell stories. His name, it was Sir Guy of Warwick, brave and wise. And years later, her son William would remember the tales of their legendary ancestor, Guy of Warwick. He came to England, where Athelstan the king he found. There were a lot of printed texts around of what you might call the pulp fiction of the Tudor age, which indeed tended to be prints of these old medieval romances, many of them already well over 200 years old. And for his love, I understand, he slew the dragon in Northumberland, full far in the North Country. Coventry kept its mystery cycle going until 1579. And so plenty of opportunities for both Mary and her children to have seen them. And I think we can be 90% certain, 95% certain that Shakespeare had. And therefore at this ending day, he went to joy that lasteth a. It's speculation, but with evidence about where Shakespeare's imagination really got laid down. Amen and charity. Amen. And it wasn't in Stratford Grammar School reading Ovid and Virgil, however much influence those had on him. It was something much earlier and much deeper. His mum. His mum. His mum. Yes. I think she was a good storyteller. John, meanwhile, continued his rise in the council. All those in favour. Ale taster, constable, chamberlain. And in 1568, he's elected mayor. Anybody against? So Mary was now the wife of alderman and high bailiff, Mr. Shakespeare. And now they set out to use John's position to make real money. And in Tudor England, that didn't mean hedge funds or commodity futures. It meant wool. In those days, it was a very valuable commodity. Everybody wore wool. And on Sundays, if you didn't have a woolen hat on, then you would be in trouble. And even when you died, you had to be buried in a woolen shroud. Wool was the mainstay of the economy, so the government controlled it to prevent illegal dealers undercutting the market. And that's what John was doing. There's no big profit in sewing gloves all day, but buy a sack of wool for, for eight pounds and sell it for 10, you know, that's two pounds without any work at all. The sellers won't come to him, he will go to the sellers, so he'll be traveling around the countryside. John's web of contacts spread out into the Cotswolds, up to Nottingham and down into Wiltshire. And would Mary have been keeping his books while he was away well, travelling? Did that's, they do, women do that? <laughs> did they have a hand in the business? Well, it's, it, it seems to be perfectly normal for wives and other members of the families to deal with business mm. contacts. Uh, if someone knocked on the door to pay money, for example, the wife would take it and perhaps even join in the bargaining mm. process. But a risky business, from what you're saying, when you're, it's the shady side of the law and you're not quite sure that uh, <laughs> the quality of the wool's going to be what you yes. thought it would be. <laughs> but it's all very, as you say, it's all very informal. Mm. But what makes it work is that level of trust that people have. 
But trust was a big issue in Elizabeth's surveillance society, where a network of informers, bounty hunters, snooped on everything from your business and your religion to your sex life. And astonishingly, the details of John's shady Wheeler dealings were discovered not long ago in the National Archives. Here's a case, uh, early 1571, and uh, a government informer, James Langrake of Whittlebury in Northamptonshire, has done John for illegal wool dealing. He's reported him to the Exchequer. These informers working for the government and they get a cut of the fines which are imposed on the victims and Langrake's got something against John he reported him the previous year for illegal money lending and now he gets him twice for illegal wool dealing and here's the key to the document it's the amounts involved 300 tods of wool in these two cases that's eight or nine thousand pounds weight but in monetary terms 210 pounds in Tudor money when a good house could be bought for 30 and a, a wage labourer would earn 10 pounds a year. These are enormous sums of money, which just shows you how deep John was in all this business and how dangerous the business was. This time, John was able to pay off the informer and he got away with it. Meanwhile, back in Stratford, as an alderman, John was entitled to send William to grammar school, the gateway to university and a career in the law or local office. What a proud mother Mary must have been. But her husband was now on the government's watch list. In the late 1570s, fate suddenly closed in on the family. The government turned on the illegal wool dealers with the full force of the law. And John's whole informal network collapsed. Suddenly you realise he's got a network of debt everywhere. Yes. This yeah. is a catastrophe yeah. for well, him. Really. Well, he's always got a network of debt, but he's usually got a flow of income which can keep on servicing that debt. When we use the phrase losing credit, in the 16th century, losing credit meant that you could no longer function in business because losing credit would mean that people had stopped trusting you. They didn't trust you to pay up, and so they would no longer deal with you, so your business was ruined. Then, as their money troubles piled up, in 1579, Mary's seven-year-old daughter Anne died. There's a note in the, the corporation book which gives you another insight into that moment of tragedy for the family. Item for the bell and Paul for Mr. Shakespeare's daughter for her funeral, eight pence. As Mary's eldest son would later write, when sorrows come, they come not in single spies, but in battalions. Desperate now to save money, they take William out of school to help John at work. So he loses his chance of university. And soon they're trying to raise money any way they can. You can imagine John and Mary sitting at their table here in the parlour, doing the sums as the debts mounted up. They borrowed money from friends and neighbours, from in-laws and family. Then they start selling off pieces of their inheritance. Mary gets rid of her portion of the land at Snitterfield that had come down to her through the family. John even divides the house up and leases out that side to neighbours down Henley Street, the, the Burbages, who turned it into a pub. And worst of all, Mary has to finally give up the land that she'd inherited from her father. The 30 or 40 acres with the little cottage that she and John had built on it for their tenant in Wilmcott. 
Using the house called Aspies as security, she raises 40 pounds from her brother-in-law. But it all went badly wrong. When Shakespeare's uh, father got into difficulties and he took out a mortgage on the property with his brother-in-law, obviously they fell out or there was some difficulty that he wanted his money back and Shakespeare's father couldn't uh, come up with the goods and so uh, he actually forfeited the, the property. They never get it back? No, and they never lived here. Whoa. I wonder what Mary thought about um, the collapse of John's finances um, depriving of her of her inheritance, do you think? Not very pleased, I shouldn't think, no. But just four months after Anne's death, Mary got pregnant again. After a gap of more than six years, she was in her mid-40s. Her eighth child, Edmund, was christened on May the 3rd, 1580. And a couple of years later, her teenage son William got a 26-year-old local girl pregnant, first with a daughter and then twins. So the family was now squeezed into a third of the old house with William's new wife, Anne, and four new mouths to feed. And a depressed husband living in fear of writs for debt. Mary, you'd guess, was the one who held it all together. But worse was to follow. In the winter of 1583, the government discovered a plot to assassinate Queen Elizabeth. The would-be assassin was the son-in-law of a Warwickshire gentleman called Edward Arden, one of Mary's distant relatives. The whole story may have been a sting, but to the Elizabethan state, no charge was more grave than treason. Edward was head of the most important Catholic family in Warwickshire. He was immediately put into the chamber known as the Little Ease, where you could neither lie down nor stand up. And then all the men were tortured on the rack, agonizingly stretched in order to extract a confession. And eventually the Ardens were shopped by their priest and condemned to death. The night before the execution day, John Somerville, Arden's son-in-law, who was clearly insane, uh, was taken to Newgate, where the government announced that uh, during the night he'd strangled himself. The next day, Edward Arden was hanged, taken down while still alive, disemboweled, beheaded, quartered, five days before Christmas. Around Stratford, the secret police interrogated known Catholics, searching their houses for incriminating books and writings. And as Mary was an Arden and married to an ex-mayor, her house was surely one of them. Finally, in 1586, Having been protected by his fellow councillors for 10 years, John was struck off the town council for long-term non-attendance. At this hall, it was decided that William Smith and Richard Court should be chosen to be aldermen in the place of John Wheeler and John Shakespeare, for that Mr. Wheeler doth desire to be put out of the company, and Mr. Shakespeare doth not come to the halls when they be warned nor hath not done for a long time. So nearly 20 years after her husband had been mayor of Stratford, Mary's family was ruined. But like all the best stories, there's one more twist in the plot. William now goes to London to try to make it in the theater. How exactly he did it, we still don't know. But in autumn 1592, a famous metropolitan critic, Robert Green, pours scorn on a provincial newcomer taking the stage by storm. 
an upstart crow who thought himself the only shake scene in the country. Green's attack on William was a howl of anger and envy. But uh, there's no such thing as bad publicity. At the very moment that the family had reached rock bottom in Stratford, here in London, Mary's eldest son had made it. And William's box office earnings restored the family fortunes. In autumn 1596, he went to the College of Arms in London to buy a coat of arms for his father to make him a gentleman. With a few rewrites of the family history on the application. John, his father, he said some 25 years back, had been a man of standing in society, a JP, a mayor of the town, and an officer of the Queen, which technically he had been as coroner. And of his mother, William said this, that Mary had been the daughter and heiress of Robert Arden of Wilmcott in the county of Warwickshire, esquire and gentleman. So the family could hold their heads high again in the streets of Stratford. William bought the big house by the chapel. Mary and John lived out their days in Henley Street with their daughter Joan and her children. Mary had lived from Henry VIII's time through the reigns of Edward, Mary and Elizabeth and on into James. She'd had eight children in this house. Three girls had died young. So had William's only boy. So she'd known grief and disappointment. But she'd steered the family through the commotion time. After 44 years of marriage, John died in 1601. Mary followed him in 1608, in her early 70s. She was buried here in the churchyard in Stratford. There's one last clue to Mary's life, if it is a clue. Only a few months after she died, William finally published a collection of poems that he'd worked on for most of his life. Uh, the earliest of them going back to his teens here in Stratford. And they'll become the most famous poems about love in the language. In fact, in the whole world. And the poems are shot through with a sense of the destructive power of time and the redeeming power of love. Now, he learned how to say those things at school. But perhaps it was his mother who taught him how to feel them.